Okay, let's get started. So um, this is more of a sort of a tutorial style talk than sort of a lot of slides. So it's just going to step you through some code, doing some things with Pandas. Um, now the slides are available online, so uh, if anyone's got their laptop, I'd recommend uh, following along, and you can download it later and, and sort of play with the data sets that I'm playing with here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to load up two data sets and um, go through them. So the first one is some weather data. The next is some uh, Brisbane beer data that I've hacked together. Uh, and yeah, I'm just going to take you through those. Um, so just to gauge the level of the audience here, who um, has used pandas before today, if they could raise their hands? OK. Uh, and IPython notebook? OK. Um, and who was at the first talk this morning with Arthur? OK. So this is focused a bit more for the people who um, aren't experts with pandas, but you, you, I think you'll still probably get a few things out of it if you are a bit more experienced. Um, so, first thing we need to do is to install pandas if we want to play with it. Um, and my first tip is that if you haven't got it installed and you want to play with it for the first time, you don't need to install it. Um, there's this web app called Wakari. It's um, IPython notebook hosted in the cloud for free. And you know, if you if you want to play with a pandas for the first time, that would be my recommendation of how to play with it. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, so this is IPython in the in the cloud. I can, you know, make changes and you know, if I'm connected to the network here. But anyway, um, you know, we can do our analysis without any installation. Um, once you're familiar with it, um, the best way to install it, uh, I find, is Anaconda. This is a distribution that gives you Python, a full SciPy stack, including Pandas. It works on Linux, it works on Mac, it works on Windows. Uh, it's a single installer. It's really easy. Um, uh, I've just put a patch through on the docs for Pandas this week, actually, which is um, recommending that's the way to go. So it's not um, part of the official docs yet, but if you follow that link, you'll, uh, that'll tell you how to go about it. Uh, so just briefly, why, why is, oh, should we be using pandas? Um, pandas is really Python's answer to R. They're very similar. It's very high performance. And really the way to think of it is it's an in-memory SQL or Excel on steroids. Um, and it, it's got stacks of useful features. It's really easy to do plotting, really flexible group buys. Uh, and it's built on top of NumPy, so um, it's very fast. It's memory efficient. A lot of the time you're calling out to see your Cython code. Um, and performance has really been a really key th um, part of the development of Pandas. Um, so we're going to start looking at this weather data. Um, so step one is to load our data. And so I just went to the BOM website. This is Melbourne's um, recent weather observations. It gives it to you every half an hour. I flew up from uh, Melbourne last night and got hit by a massive storm and was an hour and a half driving to the airport and delayed flight, which was very fun. So we might get some insights out of that. Um, so Pandas is really flexible, um, some convenient ways of reading in your data. If it's in a CSV, CSV, that's really easy. You can give it SQL queries or SQL tables. It can read in JSON for you. It can read in your Excel. Google Analytics, HTF5. Um, there's a stack more that I probably haven't listed, but uh, it makes that really easy. Um, so this is. URL for our CSV data that we're going to try and load up. And we call the read CSV function, and we can see that that didn't actually work. Something went wrong. So let's have a look at the raw data. If we have a look here, we can see that there's actually 20 rows of junk at the start that we're not really interested in, and it's not until row 19 
that our data starts looking like a CSV file. So we call read CSV, we tell it to skip the first 19 rows, uh, and now we have a data frame. So data frame is really the key data structure that the pandas gives you, and it's, it's a table with you know, columns and indexes. Uh, each, each column is a, is a series, and we have the index here, which is, allows us to um, access individual rows. So one way to think of a data frame is like a dictionary, um, a dictionary of columns. And so we can treat it like a dictionary. We can delete columns that we're not interested in. Uh, and if we try and access a column, we get back a column. So this is the air temperature. Uh, and again, we have an index and we have the values. So because it's built on top of NumPy, doing arithmetic and, and math is really fast and it's really descript descriptive. Um, and you should never really find yourself looping through through columns and series. That's You're probably doing it wrong if you're doing it that way. Um, I don't know if we have any Americans in the audience, but I thought a simple example would be to move it from Celsius to Fahrenheit. So one line of code and it's that easy. Um, and so as an example, if, if our task was simply to grab the data, convert it to Fahrenheit, write it back to disk as a CSV, that's three lines of code. Uh, we've got the two CSV one, which is you know, the opposite of read CSV. Uh, and so if you ever find yourself using import CSV, you're probably much better to be using pandas, I think, in almost any case. So we've loaded the data into memory. Now we need to clean our data. And the unwritten rule of data analysis is really this is where you're going to spend most of your time, getting it looking nice and, and how you want it. Uh, so if we look at the data, the first thing we'll notice is we've got these weird column names with the 80 at the end. I don't know what the deal is with that, but let's fix that first. Uh, so we've got the rename method. So if I pass it a dictionary, it's going to change name to name 80 to name. So that was pretty easy, but we've still got all these other columns that are no good. So I can also pass it a function. So fix column names is pretty simple. I'm just going to replace where I see 80 with nothing. I'm going to pass in the function, and now we've got some better column names. So we've seen that you can treat a data frame like a dictionary. You can also treat a data frame like a list. Uh, to do that, we use this uh, iloc um, attribute. Uh, and so if we want to get the first row, we just pass it the first element, and it returns us a series with the data. So here the index is the different column names, uh, and then we've got the different values. Does anyone notice anything weird about the last row of the data set? So this brings me to the next thing, which is uh, NAN, which is not a number, which is... Um, so if we have a look at the last four rows, we can do slicing as well with, with I, I work. You'll notice that the last two rows are pretty dodgy, and that was from the CSV that we had, that it's got these empty um, final line and then the one with the dollar in it. So let's get rid of that. So yeah, so uh, a NAN, if you used to SQL, think of it like a null. It's just where you say there was some missing data here. And we've got these methods that make it uh, easy to work with nulls. So if I call is null, um, it's going to return true and false for every row in my data saying whether or not it was null. Not null is the opposite. Uh, and I can also fill missing data with, with zeros or means or depending on the context, what I want to do with it. So there's three ways we could get rid of this data. We could just do a slice and get rid of the last two. That's pretty easy. We can call drop NA. Drop NA is going to look at each row. If there's any nulls, it's going to discard it. 
Uh, I'm going to do a third way, which is a bit more flexible. So this is, if we call not null on our series, it's going to go through every row in our, in our data and say, is it not null, not null. And so we see we've got true, 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 uh, with our two falses at the bottom. Um, which brings me to another way of accessing our data. So if we pass one of these Boolean in indexes, so it's really a list of true, false, true, false, false, true, uh, to our data frame, it's going to filter out uh, where it's false and just return you where you've got true. So um, this is going to give me everywhere where it's true and it's going to get rid of those last two lines of data. I could have done that in one line. And now if we look at the, the end of our data set, um, it looks a lot better. Does that look like good date time data to anyone? No? Uh, so you can see that's passed it in as a float because of the data format that the bong has decided to use for their CSV. Uh, which brings me to my, my next point. Um, so if you have a look at the bottom, you can see that the, there's a D type for our data. So each of our columns is a homogeneous type. So most of these are floats where it's a number. Uh, you can see um, you know, the apparent temperature is a float. That seems to make sense. Let long is a float. It can also be an object. In this example here, those objects will just be strings where it's string data, but it can be arbitrary objects in, in your data if you'd like. Um, and if we find our local date time full, that's a float and that, that's not right. So let's fix that. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move it from a float to a string. Now it's looking a bit more like uh, date time data but we can do one better. So here I'm calling map, which is you know, similar to the standard library map. It's going to call this function on every row of my data. Um, so pandas has this really convenient two date time function. If your data has anything that looks like a string and you pass it to two, two pi date time, it will figure out and passes a date time. You don't need to tell it the format normally. It's pretty smart in figuring out. Here's some examples that it would make sense of. I find pretty much almost anything I throw at it, um, it'll figure it out. So here, um, you know, we've changed it to a string and then we're gonna call to date time. Uh, and now we have a date time 64 D type, which is stored as an int. Uh, it's much more efficient and it gives you nanosecond resolution of your, your time data. Uh, yeah, so just to, to talk about the index a little bit. So if we don't specify an index, it's going to, it's like kind of like a SQL auto incrementing ID is kind of what it does. It, it calls range length of my, my data. Uh, and so that's why it's listed here as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, now for our data that doesn't make as much sense, so I'm going to set the index to be that date time. Um, I'm going to sort that index because it was in reverse order before. Uh, and now our index is this, this data that we've got every half an hour with these observations of temperature and things like that. So now that I've got a date time as an index, I have a time series. Uh, this gives me lots of flexible features, one of which is smart indexing. So if I want to get just 2014's data, that will return it to me. If I want to get just a month, this will return it to me. If I want just a day, this will return it to me. I can also do slicing. Now, slicing like this will give you both ends of the data, not like a normal list slice. Uh, and so this is giving me between 3.30 and 5 o'clock data that I'm interested in. So yeah, a quick recap of, of how to get at your data with, um, with pandas. You can treat it like a dictionary and give it its labels of the column or the index. We can treat it like a list with the 
PyLoc and we can do slicing and things like that. Uh, and we can do Boolean indexing where if we pass in a, a true false list, it will give us where we pass in a true. And so we've got our data frame, which is you know a table of data. The series are each columns. We have an index, and if uh, the index is date times, then you've got a time series. So we've got a clean data set now, or a much cleaner data set. Let's do some analysis. So it's really easy to do some graphing with pandas. One line of code here, I've plotted um, the temperature and the apparent temperature. Uh, because it's a time series, then it's, 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 um, it's figured out my x-axis uh, like that for me. If you have a look around about 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon, storm hit. The temperature dropped uh, 10 degrees in under an hour. Uh, there's also a lot of rain. And yeah, it was sort of got very cold very quickly. So because we have this time series data, we can uh, resample our data. So we were given half the hourly data. If we wanted it to be every four hours, we call resample. Uh, we say how frequently we want the data, and we want it. We uh, tell it how we want it to figure out um, the value. So here we've gone for the average every four hours. So now we've got. Uh, our data every four hours, if that was what we wanted. We can also make it more granular. If I pass it 15 minutes, uh, I then need to tell it how to fill in the missing gaps. And here I've told it to fill forward. I could have told it to fill backwards. So I can also uh, give it a limit of, of how many gaps to fill. If, if there's a big gap, I only fill in, say, three. Um, I don't use this a lot. Um, I don't think it does. I, I, I would imagine there would be a way of, of hacking something like that, that in, in other methods, but I don't think, I think there's only forward and back from fill method, but it would be worthwhile checking the docs. Um, okay, so and we've got our you know standard statistic method, methods that it gives us, so I can call the mean on, our, on my series. A really useful one is describe. It'll give me the the quartiles of my data. It'll give me my standard deviation, my mean, the number of values. And if I call it on the data frame itself, it's going to do that for every column in my data column um, in my data set. Um, so this is a, a larger example. Don't don't try and follow along with a, all the code here. But basically, what I'm doing, I've downloaded um, for the last couple of days the data for Brisbane and Melbourne. Um, so here, I'm just creating a list. Uh, I'm reading in each one as a data frame and, and adding that to a list. Concat allows me to stitch my data frames together. So this is going to just end to end by row. Um, stitch together all that data into one data set. Because that's going to have overlapping date ranges, I'm going to drop where there, there's any duplicates. Uh, and in this example, instead of just the date as the index, it, we, we want both the date um, and the, the city. Uh, so now our data looks like this. Uh, we've got our two levels index and we've got both cities data. Um, so the next feature I'm going to talk about is uh, stack and unstack. It's another useful way of um, playing around with your data. Uh, and it's pretty simple. So unstack, if I call unstack on my data, it's going to take this, this index here, this, this column of my index of the name, and it's going to make that a uh, into columns, so then I'm going to have a column for uh, both Melbourne and Brisbane's air temperature, uh, every column in my data set. The other thing I can do is I can call, um, so that's unstack. If I call stack, it's going to grab all my columns um, and make my data into a record format. So that probably doesn't make a lot of sense without an example, so let's do that. 
So if I unstack my data by name, now I've got a column for each one of my cities. And we can see that it's definitely warmer in Brisbane. If I call stack on my data, it's going to grab all of those columns and put them into one column and then also grab all those values and make that a column. So now, for example, if I was going to store my data in a database, that might be a good way of, of shaping it. And it's you know, just a couple of lines of code. Uh, and so that allows us to do some um, plot another graph. So here I'm getting the apparent temperature. I'm stacking it and then I'm plotting it. And we can see that since I left Melbourne, it's kind of been about as cold as your fridge. And we're not really seeing the hockey stick effect in Melbourne that we've seen in Brisbane this morning. Um, so that's my first data set. Uh, it's getting close to lunch. I'm getting a little bit thirsty, uh, which brings me to my second data set. Um, last week I found out about a website called nowtaps.com. Has anyone heard of this? Uh, it's a website, it's a social media app basically. You go to a pub, you order a beer, you sort of log in, um, check in Foursquare style, and you say, I was at this pub, I had this beer, it tasted great. I can then log in and see which pubs have what beers on tap where. Uh, so I had a look at that. I kind of hacked their API to get a couple of data sets for Brisbane that we're going to have a look at. So yeah, this is their website here, so I can see. Hopefully the network's going to help me out here. Maybe not. But yeah, I can search by the map and it's, it would list me um, all the beers that they've got on tap and what people thought of them. I'm going to have to look at my data set. Um, okay, so I had about 20 venues in the Brisbane area close to the conference centre, so I've downloaded these into a data set called venues.csv. Uh, so if we load that up, we can see we've got each of the, the bars, we've got the latitude and longitude, uh, we've got this venue ID which is we're going to come in useful later, uh, we've got the address, etc. So where is the closest pub to where we are right now? Um, again, we can use the, the fast math uh, NumPy style code here. It's just, just Pythagoras' the theorem, square root of two squares of the distances. So I'm setting that as a my new dist column. I'm going to sort by distance so that the first one is the closest. And we can see that the closest pub is the Archive Beer Boutique, 100 Boundary Street, West End. <laughs> is that... It's not close. No, uh, of the, of the um, pubs that I've got on my no. list, though. No. Okay, well... Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm sure I am wrong. I'm sure that the archive beer though was closer to them, like the scratch or the canvas cocktail. <laughs> Which one is closest on the list? It could be where I've set my Latin long. That was off G Maps, somewhere in this area. But okay. Well, yeah, I didn't. I didn't want to put like a five-line formula in my slides. Um, this is one that got into my data set that's in Sydney, so at least we know that that is definitely the furthest away pub <laughs> on the list. So that was, that was my main validation. So um, This is also available on GitHub, so pull requests are um, 
accepted. All my slides here are from IPython notebook, so you can, um, yeah, please fix my code. Anyway, we, we can see we've got some, some pubs closer than, than others. Um, which makes me thirsty. Wait for it. Um, so there's two parts of this data set. We've seen the venues. We've also got the check-in. So this is, you know, each individual person has gone, had a beer, checked in, um, possibly left a, a rating and a, a comment. So we've got the different beers that they drank, where they drank them, who brewed them, where they're from. Uh, got a rating. Um, the other important thing here is we've got a venue ID. So that's going to be part of our next step. which is that we can do fast SQL style joins. Um, it's really simple. We call the merge function for pandas. We pass in our two data sets. Um, actually, by default, if there's any common columns between the data sets, it'll join on those. Um, here, I've been explicit and said join on the venue ID. And I've told it to do an inner join. I could have done a left, a right, an outer join. You can handle all of those. Um, really smartly. So now we've got one data set with all of our data. So we, hit, we can see we've got, we've now got our beer data, but we've also got, uh, you know, our lat long and our venue and the address. Uh, so what can we do with this? So what's, what are the popular beers in the area according to now tapped drinkers? Uh, we've got the value counts methods of a, a series. This will do frequency counting for you of, your, of the data that you pass to it. Uh, so here we're getting the top 10 um, beers that appear in that data set. Um, so apparently people like Pale Ale. Um, if I give it a normalize equals true parameter, it will give me uh, relative frequencies. So here, uh, of times by 100 to get a percentage, so it's about 3% of people who, who've checked in for this uh, pale ale. Um, so it brings me to group by, which is sort of one of the killer features of pandas, really. It's a bit analogous to SQL group by, but much more powerful and, and flexible. Uh, and the concept's pretty pretty simple. It's We split our data according to some parameters. We apply data to each of those um, data sets, uh, and then we combine it again. Uh, and it's, it's very flexible. So who has the most variety of beers uh, of those pubs listed? Um, so this is a, a function that we'll call nUnique. nUnique is another feature of a series. It'll tell you how many unique values you have in your data set. Um, as an aside, we're working on a patch at the moment that's going to speed that up a hell of a lot. Hopefully that gets merged soon once I've got some time and I'm not running a talk. Um, so we call group by on our data set. We're going to group by name, which is that's the venue name. We're going to look at the beer column and we're going to run an aggregate. Um, and so we're going to have a result of numbers, which is going to call for each of those groups, the unique function up here. So here's the result. We can see that the embassy seems to have the biggest choice of beers. Um, this is the one that I said was closest. What, what was the real closest one? Tomahawk. Yeah, see, they haven't got as much range. Um, so. You know, we can see that this is the SQL that would kind of do a similar thing um, for people who are more familiar with SQL. Um, so another straw poll. Hands up if you like beer. Not bad. Hands up if you like chocolate. It's more people. Hands up if you like chocolate beer. This is a Victorian brewer, Holgate. They brew a, a chocolate porter called the Temptress. Um, it has 
chocolate and vanilla beans as part of the ingredients. It's very good. Where can I get one? In Brisbane. Uh, so here we, I'm setting the is delicious. That's going to be one of these Boolean true false values. I have um, Python has these vectorized string operations that, that calls out to these Cython um, implementations of um, the various string things that you'd be normally have string operations. So this is going to be for me any beers with the name 10% in it, just because I wasn't sure if it would have you know a couple of words in the title or something. I'm going to get just the subset of the data that is uh, the beers that are the temperatures. I'm going to sort that by credit out. Now, credit out's when someone's checked in, and I want that going for most recent, because if someone drunk one a month ago, that doesn't mean it's still on tap. So if we have a look at our data. There is one, two, three, six people who in recently who have had a temptress. They've had them at one, two, three, four different uh, venues. Uh, and actually, the Archive Beer Boutique, someone had one last night at 7.30. <laughs> um, apparently, it's on the hand pump. And it's chocolatey and vanilla. <laughs> I was uh, 7.30, I was in the air. I should have probably already arrived. Anyway, no, it wasn't me. I might check in tonight after we saw the app. Or after this talk. Um, so this is my last thing to cover. Um, Excel has pivot tables. Seagull doesn't have pivot tables. Pandas has pivot tables. It's pretty simple. Uh, I tell it what I want the rows to be. Here it's the different beers. I tell it what I want the columns to be. This is the different venues. I tell it what values to look at. It's the rating people. I think it's a five star rating. Uh, and then I tell it how to aggregate that. So we want the average rating um, so we can see. Um, I don't know, the uh, Indian parallel averages a four star rating at the Collaroy, wherever that is. Oh, that's in Sydney. Um, so to wrap up, um, Pandas is an invaluable tool. Um, if I'm playing with any kind of data, it's just the first thing I turn to. Uh, so start playing with it. The, the documentation is really good. Actually, during this talk, I've read through most of it and, and also made a lot of patches to, to improve it along the way. Um, there's an O'Reilly book. So Wes McKinney is the guy who wrote Pandas. He's a really smart guy. Uh, so he's the guy who's written this book. It says Python for data analysis. It's really just mainly covering Pandas and, and IPython. Um, I would highly recommend that. Uh, it's about finishing me up. Um, we're also hiring at the moment. Come speak to me during the, the talk. Otherwise, um, questions and beer time.